Hello and welcome back to Express Videos for ACCA Paper F7. In order to actually um, fully cover this chapter, it is really advisable to download our Express Notes from www.thexpgroup.com. Why I'm saying that is because it's really difficult actually to cover group accounting without some numerical examples. The express note will not be enough to fully understand and study groups, which most likely it will be question one in the F7 um, examination. Why do we produce group financial statements? Again, eh, we are talking about here substance over form. Companies will do trade via a group of companies, each of the company in the group. So we will have a holding parent and a subsidiary. They will produce individual financial statements. The investors, however, in the holding company will be interested to see the net assets and liabilities of this subsidiary, which they effectively control. This is actually achieved by a process of consolidation, which consolidation means adding up on a line by line basis, all assets and liabilities of the parent and of the subsidiary. That is called acquisition accounting. And it will reflect the true nature of the relationship between the parent and the subsidiary since actually the parent controls the net assets of the subsidiary. Let's have a look at illustration number one, where actually Peter acquired 80% of Sam on 1st of January 2000X1 for a total consideration of $140,000. Immediately after the acquisition, the statement of financial position of both companies actually showed the following numbers and we will notice that Peter has an investment in Sam. They both have other investments, property, plant and equipment, inventory and some cash. Capital of both companies, revaluation, reserve and retained earnings, non-current and current liabilities. In order to actually consolidate SAM into the statement of financial position of Peter, we will have to show the net assets to uh, the investors of Peter's because we do control them. How we can do this, we will have to find a way to actually replace this figure, the cost of investment, with all the net assets of SAM. Both the investment figure and the net assets at the acquisition date must be reflected at fair value. And if there is a difference between what we pay to acquire a subsidiary and what we acquire, which is the fair value of the net assets of that particular subsidiary, the difference, it will be called goodwill. Non-controlling interest is another concept that we need to reflect because since we bought 80% of a company, we do have control over it, but we don't own it 100%. So since we bring in the consolidated statement of financial position on a line by line basis, net assets that we control from the subsidiary, in order to reflect that we actually own only 80%, we will bring in non-controlling interest of 20%, and that will be reflected in the equity section in the statement of financial position. So if we look at the consolidated statement of financial position immediately, basically after the acquisition, exactly on the same date, 1st of January 2001, we will actually add up on a line by line basis, the assets of the parent and subsidiary, which in our case is Peter and Sam, 
So we will add them up for Peter and Sam. Other investment, property, plant and equipment, inventory and cash. The cost of the investment is de-recognized. And what we bring in is the net assets of the subsidiary. In terms of capital, we will reflect the parent only. Why? This is just another way of reporting to the same shareholders. Revaluation reserve and retained earnings. Since we are on incorporation, those reserves are the reserves which actually belong to the parent. Non-controlling interest in the net assets of the subsidiary will be brought in along with the net current liabilities and current liabilities, which this one is just an addition exercise. Now let's see how we basically compute goodwill and how do we show non-controlling interest. The process of consolidation is actually de-recognizing the cost of the investment in the subsidiary. I will bring in all the net assets of the subsidiary at fair value at the acquisition date. And that is other investment, property, plant and equipment, inventory, cash, non-current liabilities and current liabilities. Non-controlling interest are their share of the net assets of the subsidiary at the acquisition date. And a shortcut for this in the exam is the equity section of the subsidiary. Okay. So the net assets that we bring in is 150,000. We multiply this with 20% and that is actually the value for non-controlling interest, which is reflected in the consolidated statement of financial position. And the balancing item is goodwill. Remember to take the shortcut when we are actually reflected non-controlling interest and also goodwill in the consolidated statement of financial position. The way to calculate goodwill is actually taking into the account the fair value of consideration that we transfer to acquire the subsidiary, and that's 140, less the fair value of net assets acquired. And this will be represented by the capital of the subsidiary and the reserves at the acquisition date. Revaluation reserve and retained earnings. Any fair value adjustments, which we'll cover later, if those assets are not stated at fair value, but also the book value, and that will actually give us the net asset that we effectively bought on the acquisition date. We multiply this with our effective ownership percentage because we actually get only 80% out of that. And the difference is goodwill. The definition of goodwill is exactly the residual interest in the net assets of the subsidiary after we basically deducted the non-controlling interest. In subsequent periods, both companies, let's assume they traded at a profit. So both companies' net assets have been increased. In the reserves of the um, parent company consolidated accounts, we are allowed basically to reflect the reserves and gains of the holding company and also of the subsidiary, but only post acquisition profits or losses. Any gain that the subsidiary is making, let's say they make the Sam makes in the next accounting period a profit of 10,000. This one will be split. 80% of it will actually belong to our shareholders and 20% will belong to non-controlling interest. And that will be reported in group reserves. So 8,000 and 2,000 respectively. In the consolidated statement of comprehensive income, we will actually reflect the fact that our shareholders control 
the subsidiary exactly in the same way. We will add up on a line by line basis all the revenues and, respect, or, and expenses of the subsidiary since the acquisition. The correct approach in the exam will be the following. First of all, determine the group structure. This working will not earn you any marks in the exam, but it makes the difference between, you know, passing or failing this question. It's fairly important to distinguish whether or not you have control of the subsidiary because the uh, way to account for it is line by line addition of all assets and liabilities, income and expenses, the acquisition method, or if you have significant influence, which will actually mean that you will be consolidating not a subsidiary, but an associate. And I will cover that shortly. And uh, the method to account for it is going to be called equity accounting, not acquisition accounting. We have to identify any omissions and errors in companies' individual financial statements and correct this first if we have to deal with it in the exam. Then add them up. 100% income and expenditure and other comprehensive income. Remove any consolidation adjustments. And we'll talk about intra-company transactions that will have to be eliminated in full. And split the profit and total comprehensive income between non-controlling interest and the equity holders. Goodwill impairments. Remember, including IS38 uh, states the fact that purchase goodwill, which arises only on the acquisition of a subsidiary, will not be amortized. The accounting policy is to actually test it annually for impairments. And if there is some impairment to be found, this one will be booked in retained earnings of the parent. Okay, we will have an expense and we will reduce the value of the asset. Fair values. IFRS 3 actually requires that in order not to overstate goodwill or to properly calculate goodwill, the difference between what we pay to acquire a subsidiary and the net assets of the subsidiary should be measured, both of them, at fair value. It is unlikely in real life and also in the exam scenario that the assets and the liabilities of the subsidiary will be stated at a fair value. In order to correct this, we will do some fair value adjustments in acquisition and um, we will have to deal with them when we actually calculate goodwill and when we calculate retained earnings of the group. So let's look at another illustration. P, this time acquired 70% of S, 1st of April 2000X1. At the time of passage of control to P, the consideration payable to the former owners actually comprised of 10 million payable immediately in cash and a further 4 million payable in two years time. 100 shares in P at a fair value of $9.2 each and another 6 million which is payable in two years time if the gross profit percentage of S exceeds 30% over the next two years. At the purchase date, the gross profit percentage of S was 35 and thus is not expected to change. P paid its investment bankers half a million to administer the purchase and an appropriate pre-tax discount rate is going to be 10%. We are required to calculate the cost of the investment in S to be included in the computation of goodwill. So we have to make sure that consideration is stated at fair value. Fair value of cash paid immediately is 10 million. The shares must be value using the share price, not the nominal value. Deferred cash taken into the uh, consideration time value of money at an interest rate of 10% should be calculated along with the contingent cash payable. If it's likely, that the um, cash will be actually payable at the acquisition date. And according to the estimation, it's more than likely that um, this amount will become payable, as the question says, in uh, two years' time. 
also we have to take into consideration the fair value of the net assets of the subsidiary at the acquisition date in order to compare like with like. Fair value of the price paid with the fair value of net assets acquired so the goodwill would not be over or understate, understated. So the key logic is the following. Any increase in the net assets of the subsidiary will actually increase their reserves. Any additional assets will actually trigger extra depreciation because the subsidiary will charge depreciation based on their historic cost and not on the value that we put on their assets at the acquisition date. Any pre-acquisition revaluation reserve is just a fair value adjustment. Any post-acquisition will be actually dealt with in group reserves as a group revaluation reserve. And keep in mind that fair values are an estimate. And uh, there is a period of 12 months after the acquisition by which we actually will adjust goodwill. Afterwards, starting with the second accounting period after the acquisition, we don't change the computation of goodwill. Whenever there is a change in the estimation that we made, like for instance the um, uh, contingent consideration, that will be reflected automatically in the um, group profit and loss account. Another issue with group consolidation will be the pre-acquisition dividends. So, if we buy a subsidiary and immediately after the acquisition the subsidiary is paying us some dividends, then how to deal with this dividend income is basically to clear it off from the amount of the consideration paid to the subsidiary. So we'll have to clear off the investment income. We didn't make any income. We just received a payment for a dividend of a subsidiary that we just bought like half an hour ago. And we will credit the cost of the investment in order to adjust for it. If we happen to acquire the subsidiary partway in through the year, make sure that the reserves of the subsidiary at that date should be actually computed because pre-acquisition reserves, remember, we cannot consolidate. And intra-group transactions should be eliminated in full. We are presenting now the consolidated statement or financial position or income statement in the exam scenario by just adding up to individual financial statements. Any intra-group transaction that happens between the parent and the subsidiary should be eliminated in full. We are not trading with each other, in other words. Okay? The approach in the exam will be the following. Identify the intra-group transactions, which may be sale of inventory, transfer of a non-current asset, granting loan to the subsidiary, receiving dividends from the subsidiary. So identify the intra-group transactions between the parent and the subsidiary. Work out any items in transit, which can actually be cash in transit or goods in transit. And make sure that the intra-group balances agree. So one company will have the receivable, the other company will have the payable. We make both of them agree and we cancel them out. And then we just add them up uh, as line by line basis as we have done in the previous illustration number one. Sometimes The transactions that happen between the company are actually performed at the profit. So I'm selling inventory, the parent is selling inventory to the subsidiary at let's say a markup of 10%. If those inventories are not sold outside the group by the year end, then the, pro the profit which is actually reported by the parent is not yet realized. We just moved the inventory from one warehouse to another and we reported this transaction first of all as a sale and second we actually reporting a profit on it. 
in order to eliminate this profit we will actually reduce the group revenues and also cost of sales intra-group receivables and payables will be cancelled out okay alone one will have an asset a financial asset and the other one will have a financial liability make sure they agree and therefore eliminate them intra-group trade payables and receivables if we are selling inventory or non-current assets between the group companies it will be eliminated exactly in the same way what we need to clear off or make sure is which of the adjustments will actually affect the profit which will have no impact on the reported profits of the group so every time we make an allowance for the unrealized profit this will reduce the retained earnings of the seller so remember one rule in short the seller will adjust intra group sale and purchase will actually be having zero effect on profit cash in transit intra group loan and intra group trade receivables and payables will have no impact on group retained earnings now the companies may trade with each other and the object of the trade may be a non-current asset. Most of the cases non-current assets will be reported, the transfer will be done at a profit and the adjustment necessary will be to eliminate the profit of the transaction exactly in the same way as we did for inventory and there will also be some depreciation adjustments because the subsidiary for instance will actually charge depreciation on the value which includes the element of profit and we have to adjust it by increasing the profit of the subsidiary to actually get rid of the element of profit which is not realized with respect to goodwill, there are two accounting treatments prescribed in IFRS 3. The full goodwill method or the fair value and the proportionate net method. In the full goodwill method, we will give or actually we will recognize in the consolidated statement of financial position not only the goodwill which relates to the parent but also the full goodwill which is controlled by our shareholders meaning we will take into account the goodwill which relates to non-controlling interest an associate as we briefly touch upon it before it's a company where basically we don't have control like in a subsidiary where with more than 50 percent of the voting shares we have control of the subsidiary and therefore we consolidate on a line by line basis we recognize goodwill and non-controlling interest as we have been discussing so far for an associate we have what is called significant influence meaning we own between 20 but less than 50 percent of the voting shares and the technique is called equity accounting which is a very simplified form of consolidation since we don't have control it will be inappropriate to add up on a line by line basis the net assets of the subsidiary and therefore if we have significant influence the shortcut will be actually to call to actually include in the statement of financial position only one line which is called investment in associate which basically will reflect the cost of the investment in the subsidiary plus the post acquisition growth in the net assets of the associate in the statement of comprehensive income we will basically have one line which is called share of profits from associate And if the associate actually has some other comprehensive income, like an increase in the revaluation reserve, we will have the second line, which is called share of other comprehensive income from associate. 
And in here, we will take our share of the profit of the associate. So for instance, if the, pro, if the associate makes 100,000 as profit and we own 30%, therefore 30% will be reflected on this line, which is called share of profits from associate. Significant influence. What it actually means, it means that you don't have control of a subsidiary, but you have significant influence, meaning representation of the board of directors. You share key personnel between the companies, key technological information. Either the investee is just a part of the supply chain of the investor, and um, there is evidence that um, the investee company is actually used to accepting the investor as having significant influence. Meaning I can influence the operating and financial policies, but I can never control them.